The Old Testament reading for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost is from the 19th chapter of 1 Kings. There Elijah went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the caves. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whom, whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Well, the gospel is taken from St. Matthew's Gospel, 14th chapter, 22nd verse. 
Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they cried. They kept in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water to Jesus. When he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. But thou, O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Praise be to thee, O Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A few moments ago in the hymn we sang. Faith shall cry as fails each sense. Jesus is my confidence. And just a moment ago we say, Savior, I follow on, guided by thee, seeing not yet the hand that leadeth me. Hush be my heart and still, fear I no further ill, only to meet thy will, my will shall be. The confidence of kingdom people, our confidence, is in Christ and the promises of God that are in Christ Jesus. Paul says, "All of uh, every yes and amen is found in Christ Jesus. And so the lessons uh, that are appointed here, I think, very much show us living the life of faith. As Paul would put it, walking by faith and not by sight. And I love Holy Scriptures because it really does two things. Of course, it does a lot of gospel thing, right? It paints us in all of our weakness and how we, we are, right? The law always accuses, and, but yet also shows us our merciful and gracious God and all his goodwill toward us in Christ Jesus. And you see this uh, in the lessons that are appointed for the Sunday. In the... Uh, the Old Testament lesson that is appointed for us, we have the account of Elijah from 1 Kings 19. And uh, remember, Elijah is the great prophet, right? The greatest of the prophets. When uh, Jesus does on the Mount of Transfiguration, who appears there? It's Moses and Elijah. So if you're looking for the prophet of the Old Testament par excellence, other than Moses himself, it's Elijah. And we find Elijah, though in a cave, Fearing for his life. Afraid. And if you don't know the context, it, it's helpful to know to see how silly this really is. The context just before this, Elijah has just defeated the 400 prophets of Baal. Remember the challenge, right? You, you cry to your God and, you know, I'll sit and wait. And, you know, pour water on the altar, pour water in the trench, all over, whichever, whoever's God is God, will, you know, burn the sacrifice. And they're crying and screaming, and they can't do anything. And he prays, of course, to the Lord, and the Lord burns up the sacrifice and shows that Yahweh, the Lord, is the one true God. And so he has this great victory, in fact. Uh, they kill the prophets of Baal. 400 of them. Why is Elijah in the cave? Because one woman, who's the queen, Jezebel, is trying to kill him. But he just saw what happened, right? He just experienced he was there. And yet, he 
Here he is, in the words of Jesus to Peter, a man of little faith. He's afraid. And of course, I love the, uh, the account here, right? It's, um, he's not in the wind, he's not in the earthquake, he's not in the fire. And, and God, by the way, the Lord is in the wind, he is in the fire, he is, but not for Elijah. He's for Elijah in the whisper. Of course, God is everywhere. God takes care of all things. But he's in certain places for you. Where he has placed himself. That you might have confidence and certainty and be sure that he's there for you. And he comes to Elijah like our Lord always does and says, Elijah. And this, by the way, this text is a great text, the Old Testament text. It could have been used for the uh, parable of the wheat and the tares, right? Wheat and weeds. Elijah's living by sight. He's afraid of Jezebel. And God says, because he says, what, I'm the only one. I'm all there is. Right? And God says, no, nah, there's 7,000 who have not bent the knee to Baal, or kiss Baal. And uh, like the weed and the tares, right, you know, they grow up and, and, and you look at the field and wow, what a mess. And yet, the weed is still there. And God's not going to take away the tares because if he does so, it'll injure the weed. And Elijah has a job to do, to be the prophet of the Lord. And God's kingdom is going to come. And there's 7,000 that Elijah's not even aware of who are part of that kingdom. But Elijah, too, shows um, a, little faith, a little faith, man being a man of little faith, and is, again, um, needing to be comforted by the Lord. In the epistle lesson, uh, Paul had to learn to live by faith and not by sight, right? Um, he says here, that uh, uh, I speak the truth in Christ, I'm not lying, my conscience, conf conscience confirms in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brother as those of my own race, the people of Israel. And Paul had to actually have an appearance from Christ himself, right, to come to faith. I say, like I say, he literally knocked off his high horse. And, uh, but how hard that must have been, right? You would think that since Jesus is Israel's Messiah, that most of Israel would accept him. But that's not what your eyes tell you, right? Most have rejected him. That's why he has this great sorrow. By the way, this is a great text, too, that shows that when Paul later says all Israel will be saved, he doesn't mean all Jewish people whole nation of Israel as a people. But if it did, why would he have anguish for them? Uh, but there are 7,000. There's a remnant. And God sees them. And whether we see them or not is not the point, but God sees them. And God wants us to live by faith, not by sight. There's a story of uh, a young ch child uh, and his father the house caught on fire. The young child was up on the second floor. Dad's outside. There's smoke and fire and flames. The, ch the son, the kid is scared. The little boy is scared. Dad says, jump, I'll catch you. The little boy says, Daddy, I can't see you. I can't see you. There's smoke, there's flames. I can't see you. I'm scared to jump. And Dad says, it doesn't matter whether you can see me. I see you. <laughs> Jump! We have a Lord who sees us even when we can't see Him. In the Gospel lesson, this gets driven home especially. Jesus' famous incident of Him walking on the water, right? He's, uh, remember we just had the feeding of the 5,000. The apostles come and say, dismiss the crowds, Lord. There's, we can't take care of them, right? And Jesus says, no, no, you feed them. And then he feeds them. Okay? 
Here, he's, and Jesus in this thing is completely in control. He dismisses them. He says, go on ahead. I'm not sure how they thought he was going to get to them. Right? But you go ahead on the boat. And, uh, and then he dismisses the crowd. He's in charge. He goes up on the hill to pray by, to pray by himself. By the way, if Jesus needs prayer. And it says, when the evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land. And it's buffeted by waves because the wind was against it. It's just hard rolling. It's not like in chapter 8 of Matthew where right, the thing's about ready to capsize. We're not to envision that. But, but hey, they're working hard, you know, trying to get across. Uh, and during the fourth watch of the night, this is uh, between 3 and 6 in the morning, darkest time. Uh, Jesus goes out to them, walking on the lake, walking on the water. The disciples see him, they are terrified. It's a ghost, they say, and they cry out in fear. And Jesus responds, take courage, it is I, and in the Greek it's ego and me, and, uh, which is a short form of, from Isaiah, um, I am he, which is a divine title for God. And by the way, why is he walking on the lake? What's the point of that? Other than showing the miracle, of course, right? But... In, in the Old Testament, it is Yahweh, it is the Lord who rules over the waters, who walks on the waters, the book of Job says. And so he's showing who he is, showing his deity, showing what he's capable of doing, right? And, uh, and he comes to them. And I love Peter. Uh, Lord, if it's you, Jeff Gibbs suggests, and this may be right, that even here Peter has doubt. This is the same thing that was said by Satan, right? If you are the Son of God. It's the same thing said by the crowds, right? If he was the Messiah, if you are the Son of God, come down off the cross and then we'll believe in you. But here the Lord allows Peter to do it. He says, all right, come to me. And Peter gets out and he's actually, if you're reading it, he actually walks on the water. Like Elijah, he gets to see, he gets a glimpse and then what happens? He saw the wind. He was afraid. He stopped, takes his focus off of Christ, our confidence, and puts it upon the challenges. And he starts to sink. And of course, I love this too. Immediately, he cries out, Lord, save me. He, at least he knows where to go for, <laughs> for his help. Lord, save me, and immediately the Lord does. And then they climb into the boat, and then now it says they worshiped him and said, truly you are the Son of God. In Matthew 8, when it happens, they ask the question, who is this that even the winds and waves obey? Here, it's, no, it's not who is this, it's you are the Son of God. And in all of these cases, people are, you know, again, you, we see us in our warts and our shortcomings. We talk about Bartholomew, right? Nazareth, can anything good come from there, right? Um, you, you name any of the apostles, right? They all have their times Tom, doubting Thomas, right? And uh, that's a good reminder of our fallenness. I like, it's a good reminder to me. I like it because I think, well, I got a shot then. Because, you know, right, sometimes our faith is doing pretty good and sometimes it's here. But the point is that our faith isn't in our faith. Jesus calls Peter, right, little faith, and he doesn't let him drown. Yeah, you got a little faith. Hardly gets him, lets him get wet. He saves him immediately. And uh, this is what it is to live by faith and not by sight. To trust that daddy sees it all. And knows it all. And then he promises to be there for us. And he does give us visible things. He gave Elijah, saw a visible, tangible thing uh, in the defeating of uh, prophets of Baal. He does it for Peter as Peter walks on the water. Uh, he did it for Nathaniel, right? I saw you sitting under the tree. And he does do that. Um, and he, because he locates himself where his promise is for us. Uh, where we're to have confidence, to live by faith and not by sight. He does that when he brings us together in this place, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. 
even though you know, it might be 25 or less. Right? Um, he places his name upon us in the waters of holy baptism, and he says, you're mine. You have a little faith, you're mine. He speaks in the words of a holy absolution, where he says, and this too is for you. And in a few moments, our eyes tell us bread and wine. But the promises tell us what? This is my body. This is my blood for your forgiveness. You see, we can live by faith and not by sight because of the one we have confidence in. Jesus is our confidence. Thanks be to God. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus always.